Welcome back to Hustle Nation Podcast. This is episode number seven. We've gotten through the whole acronym of Hustle. So whether you're new to us, or you've listened to a couple episodes, we're going to start to really dive into some new subjects. Uh, and today we got a real treat. We're going to talk a little bit more about 2022 leadership and business trends. There's a lot that's been shaking up the business world, not just this year, but the last couple years. So we'll talk in depth about that. And we'll also then recap what some of our predictions are for 2023. So Dustin, I'm going to pass the baton off to you. What is subject number one for 2022 leadership trends? So uh, one of the things I think that has been really interesting in 2022 is this clash of cultures relative to remote work, hybrid work, and then in-office work. And this is there's been a lot of talk about this uh, over the last year, and certainly it's been, it was spurred on by COVID, but it's been it, really interesting to see how we look at the end of this year versus how we looked at the beginning of this year. You know, in many ways, you know, the beginning of this year, the the talk was, you know, remote work is the thing. Everyone is going to get away from the office. You know, office cultures don't really have any impact. To then all of a sudden you start seeing, you know, even Silicon Valley and tech companies, which everyone assumed would be the last companies to ever bring somebody back into the office, actually requiring people to come back into the office so many days a week because, you know, they too had realized from a culture perspective, there needed to be some sort of investment in that. And, you know, it's interesting, no matter who you talk to, everybody's right, right? So if, if you're a fully remote workforce, you're... You're the genius and that's the the right way to go. If you're a hundred percent in office, you know, how could you how can you have a culture without? And you know, I think, you know, like so many things, I think every business it's different. And I think uh, you know, hybrid is certainly a a big part where a lot of organizations have found themselves in the middle. Uh, but it it's created some really interesting conversations about about culture. Uh, you know, one of the probably the most interesting things that I've seen is for a while there, it was uh, you know, I would say pre-COVID, if you were talking to people about remote work or even a hybrid work environment, there were a lot of people that would just say, well, you can't have culture and have that structure. And which is crazy, right? I mean, that's, that's not, not true, true at all. There, there are tons of organizations that work 100% remote that have culture. Now, it may not be the culture you want, or it may not be the culture that your organization has historically had, but that doesn't mean there's not a culture and it doesn't even mean it's a bad culture. You know, it just means that it is a culture. And really what I think I've seen is, you know, I don't care who you are. I've seen businesses that have nailed it on remote, nailed it in an office and have nailed it in hybrid. And I think, I think there's a lot to do with what your culture, what you want it to be. And you know, what, what maybe your industry is used to, you know, as an example, you know, the, the, you know, manufacturing type industries where you have 70 to 80% of your workforce that has to show up because you, you have to do the work, right? You have to, you have to build the thing. You know, certainly the 20 to 30% of office workers in that organization, it's really, really hard for them to be uh, hybrid and even more so for them to be remote. But there's so many organizations in this world that you don't need to have anyone in person and therefore you, you know, being remote can work all day long. But the thing that has, has amazed me more than anything is it really has come down to, are you designing your culture intentionally or just mm -hmm. randomly? Because that's, that I think has ultimately been the thing. There's people that are like, well, I, I have to have people in the office because I have to see them and I have to interact with them. And don't get me wrong, you know, like uh, for, for us at McClone, we, we believe that there needs to be some in-office element uh, because of our business. Our, our business is highly collaborative. Uh, we, you know, geography does matter because we have to be in front of our customers often in person. So there, there is some of that that is needed. But really, our, our in-office requirements are not high. We could do a lot in the hybrid. But the key is, is we've had to be more intentional than about what that means, right? What, what does that culture mean? And how do we, uh, how do we bring in people? How do we integrate new people? How do we tell people what our culture is so they can decide, is this a culture I want to be part of and add to, or is this a culture I'd, I'd rather go somewhere else? So it sounds like you talk to people and including yourself 
And pre-COVID, there was a lot of companies that were in person, but were those big corporations like those Fortune 500s were just changing their tune a little bit on more flexibility, more casual work environment with dress and things like that. And COVID obviously brought a lot of the workers saying, we really like this remote thing. Or maybe in your case, we kind of like the hybrid thing. And it seems like now as... I hate to say this, some people may disagree. COVID seems to be more in the rear view mirror. Now companies are making a push to be back in person. So to your point, it's a bit of a culture clash, which is maybe the employees are starting to say, okay, you know what? I I do miss my friends. I miss my colleagues. I miss my boss. I like being in this environment because there's an argument to be made that you can be more productive at home. And there's another one to be made. You're more productive in the office. And I'm sure your boss would agree you're more productive in the office. But like you said, it depends on the culture you want to build or you want to evolve to. Because if you look at two service companies in the same industry, they don't have the same culture. Maybe they don't want the same culture. So you intentionally have to build that culture based on what is that environment? Is it in person? Is it hybrid? Is it pro-choice, meaning you can kind of do whatever you want as long as you're getting your shit done. And that to me is what's really important. And you look at all these companies, I'd be hard pressed to believe that the majority of, of companies who are successful today have made it through COVID, haven't evolved their culture. Or if you haven't, maybe you're the one who's in trouble, but yeah, you have sure. to evolve with the times to me is really the key. I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer here. I, I just think that Maybe for me, it is how are you pivoting and how are you evolving to match your workforce? Because I know you and I, we're Wisconsin based. I own a marketing company, you own an insurance company. Those two companies in California, Florida, wherever, may have a different culture because they're in different areas, different people. I may have a younger team, you may have an older team. Therefore, cultures could be different. So I think it's really a matter of you really have to take a deep look inside. And then from there, how do, how do we evolve to get to be the culture where people want to work here? Because I think that's something we're going to talk on a little bit more is how do you become more attractive? And you become attractive because you have a great culture. And as you know, that that, that is just an evolving, ever-going, fluid conversation that we're always sure. trying to perfect, right? Yeah, I mean, there there is no end game for culture, right? It's not like you've suddenly, you've nailed culture and it's perfect. Um, you know, one of the things you know, we've even seen for our organization, we, you know, we've evolved our culture every year, right? And whether it was COVID or not, right? Your culture is always, it's changing one way or the other. And it's whether you're intentionally doing it or you're not. And it's one of those things where uh, we saw this actually just at, uh, we had our kind of strategic planning as we're looking into 2023. And, you know, one of the things we've seen is our culture is differentiated and it, it is, attracting the right people, right? The people that want to be part of this culture and want to be part of something, right? That it's, it's attracting them. But, you know, there was about a week before our offsite, there was one or two things that, that kind of popped up that we just, as a leadership team, we, we just didn't like, we're like, man, this, this seems off character for us. This seems, you know, out of track. And, you know, so we talked about it actually at the, kind of the beginning of our offsite. And it was, it was interesting because as, as I shared with everyone, that's when you know culture matters is when it wasn't, you know, it's not like we have, you know, mass exodus or anything like that. It was literally just, there was one thing that we felt wasn't in line with the culture we've outlined. And, you know, to me, that's when you know you're starting to get culture by design is when, you know, your your team and your organization can spot it and can call it out so you can address it, right? Because there's no culture that's perfect. You're, you're going to make missteps, right? It's right. We're, we're talking about people here, but... Uh, the idea being is that's when you know you're doing it by design as opposed to, well, it just it changed over the course of the year. And and for, you know, attracting the right people, you know, they're they're doing their homework. <laughs> you, know, you know, there's there, people have choices. People can can choose to work somewhere or not choose somewhere. And, and they're they're asking people they're asking around. They're asking, you know, beyond just the interview question, you know, what are. Uh, what do they look like on social? What are people talking about them? What's their reputation in the community? And, you know, it, all it takes is a little bit of crack in the armor and it, it gets to be really hard for those good people to say, yeah, I'm going to take that shot. 
I'm going to talk a lot more about that in our next subject. So I'm glad you brought that up. For me, when when we zoom out a little bit, we talk about what will this look like next year and for the future. Um, I think that there's going to be a lot of companies that are going to ask their employees to come back, or that's just going to be a part of the culture because as we're going to talk about, there's a lot of turnover happening right now with positions and teams and companies. And that's just going to be a part of the new onboarding is that the expectation is 75%, 60%, whatever, whatever it is. Right. And I, I think you have to be intentional about how you communicate that. So for example, if you look at some of the millennials, if you look at really, I would say, what is the 35 and under, they and everybody, no one wants to be micromanaged. And you see these articles online from Forbes and wherever, they're talking about how we micromanage these employees who are remote and or hybrid. They wanna make sure they're engaged, they're working, you know? And that to me is, is very difficult. I think if that if that is your culture where you are hybrid to remote, I would really urge companies not to, because you're you you got to give your employees some rope, and if you give them some leash, they're either going to shine or they're going to hang themselves, because it it does it's just a matter of time before someone self selects out when given that much uh, leash, and sometimes it. It doesn't take very long. I, I don't know what you've seen, but in, in my experience with hiring people, managing teams, sometimes all you need is three, four months. And you will know for sure if this individual is fit for that role and maybe fit for your culture. So to me, if again, there's no right or wrong answer, but if, if that's the direction you're going, I think you have to be very trusting. And I, I don't think you need to put all these tools in place to ensure productivity. Because if you are truly a team, if you do truly have good culture and you have weekly, bi-weekly meetings and check-ins and you, know, you have technology like CRMs, you'll know if someone's engaged, you'll know if someone's putting in the time. And it again, it just doesn't take much to know the level of engagement and the level of productivity from your team. Yeah, and it's, it's tough because you can't be universal. You know, it's, it, no. as, as I've said from the beginning of this thing, you got, you know, there's, there's 20% of the workforce that can't work from home. There's 20% of the workforce yeah. that can't work in the office. And some of those are the same people, right? You know, it, it doesn't matter whether they're in the office or at home. And the, the key is, is identifying who are those people. I mean, I, you know, I know on our team, you know, there are certain people that, that we can absolutely prove they work so much better at home. And that's, that's what they need to do. And, and what their role requires that that makes sense uh there are others that maybe they very much could but you know they're a leader and we need them for collaboration and so you know they can be hybrid but we need them here because we need them to to spread the culture and spread their wisdom and spread their knowledge and you know things like that and you know then there's there's others that you know they need to be here right and whether that be by job or just you know what they can get done in a day you know it's been it's been interesting i mean as i look you know, where I think this is going, you know, I think in a lot of ways, productivity is, is, re is rearing its ugly head, right? You know, when, it, when an economy is kicking butt For and sure. everybody, you know, we're trillions of dollars are being injected in, in, into the economy, right? Like it's, it's tough to mess that up. Right. And, and you see it. I mean, obviously the tech companies are, are in many ways kind of leading the charge here, right? I mean, they're just doing, you know, mass cuts and, you know, lots of organizations are, are doing, you know, more cuts and more layoffs. And the reason being is because, you know, now all of a sudden there's, you know, there's rough waters ahead. Productivity matters, right? And, you know, people are starting to look at that and saying, okay, well, what does that mean? And I think the challenge is, I think a lot of organizations, you know, there are, there are people that aren't pulling their weight and there are people that are more than pulling their weight. And, and the challenge with, with that micromanagement, right? You know, there, there are times to hold people accountable. There's no doubt. And certainly there's a trust, but verify element where you have to know what people are getting it done. Right. But my experience has been, is it's really all that stuff is for is to, to try to find who, who is that, you know, where is that 20% because that 20% that's, that's lagging back and it may not even be their bad people. They may not, maybe they're not trained. Maybe they're just not efficient yet. Maybe they're just getting up to speed. Right. Poor leadership. Doesn't mean they're bad people. Yeah. But poor <laughs> leadership. Right. I mean, it can be a lot of those things, but that 20% or whatever that number is, is so critical because if, if you have that 20% and they're not being productive for whatever reason, 
the 80%, the 80% of people that you trust that you can rely on that are doing the day to day, they all of a sudden have to do 20% more than what they can to try yeah. to get it done. And, and that's, to me, that's where the golden nugget is, is how do you, you know, how do you drive the understanding of where there are productivity gaps, not to say to the 80% that, you know, are cranking it and you know, that are, they're, they're doing the thing. Okay. Let, let them run, but let's make sure we're finding that 20%. So we're not burning those others out. Yeah. T to me, some of the key things you touched on is um, what, what are you doing to track productivity? And it, it doesn't mean that you're monitoring people, but if you're in sales, do you have a, a billboard? Do you have a CRM? Do you have a tool? If you're in marketing, do you have an analytics tool? Are you measuring? You don't have to measure daily. You don't have to measure weekly, but can you look at this monthly and say point A to point B? Obviously, you need goals to be able to track and measure and report and you know communicate and things like that. But sure. if you have a tool, just one tool, and you're tracking a couple of things, I think that is the key for me. So let, let's zoom out since we have some other subjects to get to. Where do you see this a year or two from now? Full hybrid, yeah. full remote, somewhere in between? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, here, here's a really safe answer, right? It's going to be all over the board. But, the you know, <laughs> I think... You know, I think in reality, where I think this is going is if you look in into 2023 and maybe beyond, you know, inflation is here. We know that, right? And that that creates a lot of challenges. That's where this, you know, uh, with inflation that that squeezes margin, productivity is going to matter. Uh, it has impact on you know employees. It has an impact on the customers, right? And on on the whole economy, and that's real. And what that's going to do is, is you know, we, we're already seeing it, right? Where you know, there's argument: are we already in a recession? And you know, the idea being is I think stability is going to come back in vogue, you know, for, for the last number of years, you know, uh, stability didn't necessarily, it wasn't the sexy thing, right? It was, I, I want to be part of an organization that is blazing a trail and that is, you know, off a, a very edgy, you know, and because I don't even think about stability, I don't think about what's going to happen to this company tomorrow. And I, I think stability is going to come back in vogue. I think that's what we've seen, but the core of it, you know, I, I, as we were, as we were, you know, talking about this and trying to think about, you know, where does this come? I, you know, read a lot of different articles and there's all these, you know, talking heads of, you know, all these innovative things that are going to happen in 2023. And, you know, maybe they're all right. I don't know, but I, I still go back to, I think, you know, everything I've always seen in, in tough economies is it's back to the basics. And it's, it's the things that no one wants to talk about because they're, they're, they are so fundamental, but I mean, this is, you got to have good leaders. Go talk to your people, right? Find, talk to your customers. You know, uh, it, it's a, at the end of the day, you don't have a business if you don't have customers, right? So how are you, how are you, you know, supporting your team to support your customers? And, you know, that, that leadership development piece, I mean, still today, I mean, I think it, and this has been proven, I feel like for like the last decade, still, if you talk to people that have a manager, they will say that only two out of 10 managers don't suck, which which I believe like, it. It, it blows your mind, right? Like you think, okay, so as an organization, if I have 10 managers, that means eight of them suck and two of them are good. Is that worth it? Right. And it's, it, we, so many people spend so little time on leadership development and developing people. You know, I think, you know, again, when, when productivity matters, when stability matters, leadership matters, right? People are going to, people are going to need that leader to, to guide them through this, this difficult time. And if you don't, if you don't have, strong leaders that you're developing, that you're giving tools on how they can communicate, how they can increase their own productivity in old organization, you know, without that, I think it's going to be really, really tough. And so, it, you know, I guess that in my mind, in a lot of ways, it's just back to basics. It's, you know, what are the core things that make an organization really, 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 really strong, right? It's leadership, it's culture, you know, it's, you know, what, it, what is your mission? What are you focused on, on really getting done in the world? Not just, Hey, I want to grow. Uh, and I think if you tie those things together, those focuses that I think that'll, that'll break the, you know, kind of the good companies from the great companies. Good point. I love it. I love it. And that's a really good segue into our next subject, which is quiet quitting. Quiet quitting really became well known in early 2022, kind of as we navigated through the big pandemic. And for those of you, I know you've heard the term, but according to Wikipedia, they describe it as the elevated rate at which U.S. workers resigned from their jobs starting in spring of 2021 um, amid the strong labor demand 
uh, approximately 4 million people left their job. Now, the reason I say it's a good segue is because you said two out of 10 are considered good. I do think that was a factor in the whole thing. I really, really do. And I mean, I'd be curious to get your opinion, but obviously people at that point were maybe a little scared about, hey, where is the economy going? Where is the market? Where are we going as a country and as a world? And maybe I should look at a, another opportunity where there's more flexibility, where there's better culture. And I, I do think that culture isn't just a buzzword we've seen for the last couple of years. I, I really, truly think that matters. That may be one of the most important factors to job seekers right now, whether you're passively looking or actively looking. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think it was a number of things. I think you're absolutely right. I think people will leave their leader before they leave their company, right? You know, they, that, that's, that's said for a long such time. a driver, right? So I, I absolutely think that was a big part of it. I think uh, the reality was, is I think there was, it was a tight labor market. And I think there were some organizations that were saying, you know what, being in the office matters. And people there were, I think, a cross section of people that said, eh, I like not wearing pants to work. So I'm just going <laughs> to, you know, I, I'm going to find a, a remote job. But again, I think that's where, you know, the world is changing. So, you know, I saw a lot of organizations that were willing to accept those people for a period of time because they just needed people. But I think in the long run, so many organizations really can't figure out the productivity from home piece. And if you can't, it's really hard to sustain that in the long run. And so I think, you know, a lot of people that left, I think, you know, the reason they left in many cases was because they had other options and they didn't, they didn't like their company, whether it be their leader, whether it be the culture, whether it be they were trying to get them to, to come into work. Uh, but, but I think, you know, when we look at, you know, what, what not only drove it, but then what's going to bring it back. So uh, I think Gallup actually came out and said that they, uh, their belief is that there's actually over 50% of the workforce now is in a quiet quitting level of engagement, <laughs> right? Which is, I mean, think about that. That's, that blows your mind, right? You have a hundred people, 50 of them basically are not working, right? Like they're, they're doing just enough so they don't get fired, but they're not, they're not really engaged. They're not really working. I think it's a great opportunity again for, for organizations that really focus on culture, focus on engagement. That's their opportunity because while yes, I think a lot of people were leaving organizations, they were going somewhere, right? I mean, it, it wasn't, it wasn't like everybody was just quitting their job and hanging out on the beach, right? I mean, there was maybe some of that, but it was, <laughs> you know, there was a lot of, no, I'm, I'm leaving here to go there. And it's because, you know, now I have options. I mean, I'll even use ourselves as an example. I mean, you know, we have people now all over the country, uh, even, you know, geographies that, you know, three years ago, we would have said, wow, that's, that's two, three hours too far away. That just won't work. It's, you know, we don't know how to integrate it. You know, now we're, we're pulling those people in. We're saying, look, we, we know how to do this now. We, you know, we, we can stretch our geography greater. We know how to integrate you in a, in a more hybrid world. And so we can, we can do that. We still have our, you know, our, our lines, right? There's still certain, you know, certain roles and things like that, that, you know, we need you here. And as long as you can commit to these things, then we're in, right? So, and so that, you know, you still got to pass on some, some of those people. But I think that, you know, when you, when you have disruption, who always wins? The better companies still always win, Yeah. you know, and, and I think I think that's what you're, that's what you've seen. And I think that's what you're going to continue to see. I think, and I, I think as you look at in the last few years, one of the things that COVID did, I think it created a tremendous opportunity, but let's be real. It took a lot of energy out of the management system there, you know, as leaders, as managers, so many of us had to spend so much time just trying to figure out how the hell are we supposed to do this now? And, you know, now as, as it's becoming what I'll call more stable, we have a better sense of, okay, this is what this feels like now. This is how this works. And now let's get back to the basics. And I think that's the best organizations. That's what I've seen them do. They've now pivoted. They've embraced who they are now. They've kind of, they put their flags in the ground and now they communicate. They're driving engagement. They're, you know, talking Communication about. Communication is key. Here's what it is. Exactly right. And that's, you know, it, that's why two out of 10 leaders suck, right? Because they're <laughs> terrible at communicating. 
Two out of ten are good, I should say. What I what I'm hearing you say, and I'm going to distill this down to two words, is that organizations are being a flexible and b agile, flexible and agile. And it's like anything else. When we talk about technology a lot, you don't want to be the last adapter. You want to be an early adapter, the first adapter, because you can then be maybe closer to a disruptor, right? And so I look back at this great resignation and I have a, a very different perspective. Pre-pandemic, a lot of businesses I was talking to about marketing were so focused because the job market was, you know, 2.6% unemployment or, or lower, depending on where you're at. And it was the war on talent. And now it's, it's different, right? It's, it's a war to find talent or to compete for the talent. And, and I really believe that now more than ever, and I probably would have said this before the pandemic, but in the last few years, the job seeking um, thing has, has really turned. The tables have turned where now the power is probably more in the lap or in the hands of the job applicant. What I mean by that, I'll, I'll go into it, is you have so many options available to you. And specifically, if I'm looking for a job, um, there's a couple of ways I can find it. I can go the old fashioned way. I can go to Indeed, Simply Hired, and I can look for jobs, LinkedIn, whatever. But now there are companies that are hitting me in the newsfeed that are serving me ads. Now there are more and more recruiters that are actively going through LinkedIn and they're trying to find the right people. And it, it's really a war to compete against the talent. But what's interesting is that if I'm actively looking or passively looking, the first thing I'm going to do, if I say, hmm, that's interesting, I'm going to go to a company's Facebook page. I'm going to go to their LinkedIn page. And if I'm a younger employee, which by the way, the millennials make up more than 50% of the workforce, probably closer to 65% now. Um, and they do their research. They do their due diligence because they want to know, are there people like me? And if you're female, you want to know, hey, are there females at work here? Is this predominantly male? Um, and whatever it is, you want to know, are there people like me? Maybe similar interests. Um, and I also want to know, do they do things outside of the four walls? So is this all just an insurance company? They just hang out inside and they sell insurance all day long? Because if so, that's boring. So they, they want to know, what what are you doing in the community? You know, can I volunteer? Can I give back? Can I Can I do different things to be involved in my community to make an impact? Is the culture flexible? Do they do fun things? Do they have team building events? I, I could go on and on. And if they don't see that, they're going to see, oh, director of sales. So what? And that's what I would say to most job applications right now. So what? Who isn't hiring? Who doesn't claim to have great benefits? Well, I hope you have good benefits. <laughs> you better. You better have good pay. And But what, what are you showing people? And I think what happened was during the pandemic, later half of the pandemic, companies started to get really clever. They started to be, say, you know what? I get it. Everybody wants remote. Forget it. We're going we're gonna to do remote, at least for now. And so I think applicants saw that and they're like, mm, flexibility, remote, I'll take that, hybrid. Yeah, that's exactly what I want. And they started to show their cards a little bit more. They started to showcase who they are. And I think what happened was you're like, you know, I'm not really that happy. My company isn't really interested in letting me work remote. They're not, you know, really adaptable to this hybrid model. Therefore, I want to leave. And so I think people got really comfortable with this. So kind of zooming out, I think where I'm getting at with all of this is, you know, when it comes down to a marketing standpoint, if you have great culture, you need to show it. You need to talk about it. And if you don't, you are to me a big so what? Because when I look at applications online, I don't care if this is a sales job, marketing, CMO, CIO, whatever, um, a lot of it's the same. We have great pay. We have great benefits. You have, I don't care. What makes you different? How can you talk about your culture? What are some things that you're doing that other companies aren't? And if you look and sound innovative, I can tell you whether you're 65, you're 45 or 25, people are gonna be interested. And that to me is, is kind of where I think we've changed and where I think businesses really need to evolve right now if you haven't already. And you know, I, I've told people, I've, I've had different applications I've put up over the last year. I've had hundred, if not hundreds of applications because 
I had to get really creative. And I, I looked through tons of applications to see, okay, what are little, little things I can pull out of this one that makes this one stand out? Why is this one getting more applications than that one? And so I, I think if you do your research, you can let your culture shine through on some of these new opportunities you have you're hiring for, but you also have to show it on social media because applicants will continue to peel back the layers of the onion or peel back the curtain. And they wanna know what, what's this company like? We all know yeah. you sell insurance, but what makes you different? Why is it fun to work there? Because you know as well as I do, people want to have fun at work. They spend almost as much time at work as they do at home with their family. And so it you got to make it interesting. You got to make it fun. And e even if you think you're a little bit fun, you, you got to show it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's uh, when you think of how you how you show that, uh, we, there was an example of, there was a, a company that I had met with uh, about a year ago, excellent culture. They actually did a pretty good job of showcasing it. And then they interviewed people. Yes. When they interviewed people. They, they brought them in the side door, interviewed them in the basement. They had this beautiful facility, right? And why they didn't take them in the lobby of that beautiful facility, but nobody, had, nobody looked at it before, right? They, they're just like, man, every, our culture is incredible. We're getting the applicants, but nobody's getting pulled through. And so literally just talking to him, you're like, well, why, why don't you just interview him in the lobby, the big, beautiful lobby you spent millions of dollars on? Mm. Oh, we hadn't even thought of that. And, <laughs> and so it's, it's, it's amazing when you think about that, right? And, and this happens all the time. You, you got to talk through your, your culture and be diligent about it and market it. But then to your point, at, at every step, you know, be able to pull it through and, and display it. Because the other thing is you're not going to keep the culture if you get, bring the wrong people in. Yeah. And so it's, it's got, you know, as much as people want, in a lot of cases, they just want a warm body so they can put it in. If you bring in the wrong people, then the good people are going to go too. And now all of a sudden you're really stuck in it. For sure. I would say this, you know, with an application or your content or your website, your videos, whatever, videos are great, but you can't just tell them, you have to show them. And even that combined isn't always good enough. I think with anything that you're producing for the internet, for the world, especially content, is you have to attach an emotion or a feeling. Because if, if they can feel it, you might say, well, Chris, it's a job application. Yeah, but shouldn't they feel good about this? Shouldn't they feel inclined to apply? Because if it's just a job application, why? I, I would be asking you, why should I apply for this? What makes this so great? Well, we have great Absolutely. benefits. Okay, well, so does everybody else. Well, I have good pay. Well, we have good culture. Okay, well, I didn't, I didn't feel that. I felt a very sterile, boring application. And I, I think we could talk about this for a long time. So I'm, I'm sure if you're listening, you get the point, but you gotta, you gotta try a little harder. It's like dating or marriage or anything is you gotta, gotta put in a little extra effort. Um, so Dustin wrapping up this subject, do you see the great resignation ending? Do you see this continuing into 2022? It's 2023. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In 2023, you know, I, Yes and no. So I, I believe that there will be, I think the workforce today continue, will continue to be mobile, meaning they will be able to move from job to job relatively efficiently. And so from that standpoint, I think there will still be plenty of movement between, between employers. Um, I, I, I do think though, however, I think with the economy going to be what it is, I think people are realizing that, you know, in some ways the honeymoon is over, we need to get back to work and, you know, productivity is going to matter. Right. And so I think, I think people are starting to see what that feels like, see what that means like, you know, and what that's going to look like in 2023. So I think, I think it's, it's going to continue with the mobility, but I don't, I don't think there's going to be the mass exodus. I feel like most employers have kind of put their flags in the ground, but now everyone, now you have to back it up. So you know, now, if you're if you're putting your flag in the ground that you need, you want people to be collaborative and you want them to be in the office or whatever that is. Well, not now you got to hold true to it. Now you got to make it worth their while, right? If they're just coming into the office and it it's no different than them sitting at home, why should they do it? Then they'll just go find another job. Yeah, yeah, that's good stuff. I I agree with that 100. percent All right, topic number three: quiet quitting. I'm sure I'm sure you've heard this term. It's popped up a lot this year. Uh, probably really came to a head late summer, early fall. 
Uh, according to Forbes.com, quiet quitting is what they call it. Unsatisfied employees put forth the least amount of effort possible to keep their paychecks. Uh, the rationale for this workplace approach is that work is not the most important thing in people's lives. Uh, they shouldn't be putting in extra time without the compensation. Now, there's a lot, a lot more to that subject and to that, that whole comment. But I, I would ask, and I'd love to hear your opinion because you have a large workforce, would be, is this really a new thing or has this really been something that's been happening for a while? And I don't want to put this on millennials because I, I don't know that this is just the 20 and 30 somethings coming into the workforce. I, I don't think that's just the case. Yeah, I, I, I mean, to be honest, I remember when I first saw the term quiet quitting, I was like, this isn't new. I mean, it's this a great a new term. Truly. Yeah. I, mean, I go back to, if you remember the, the old movie Office Space, right, from, the, from the, the late 90s, where they have these efficiency consultants coming in. And basically, the, you know, the, the question is, well, what is it that you do here, right? And, you know, one of the, one of the kind of themes of the, of the entire movie is that everyone's completely disengaged because... The company culture is just sucks. Everybody's got multiple managers. Nobody sees how they're connected to the end game, right? It's kind of this very sterile environment. And I mean, that was, you know, that was 20 years ago. And we were <laughs> talking least. about that, right? So th that isn't, I mean, to me, that was quiet quitting. I, I, I understand why it's, it's coming about. It's a term that people are, are, are talking about. But to me, it's, it's the same thing that's existed forever, which is just its disengagement. You know, why, why, why should I put in the extra work? I mean, that, that's true of human nature. There are plenty of people that just don't want to put in the extra work just for the sake of it. And, you know, there's always this balance. You know, the best cultures, they reward the right behavior, right? They reward people putting in that extra effort and, and going that extra degree and things like that. But, you know, there's, there's no culture in the world that can perfectly nail that. Right. I mean, there, there will always be people that just don't want to work. And then there will be people that they want to work, but they're just not inspired. They're not motivated. They don't see what impact they're, they're making. And then there's those that'll just work no matter what you do. And to me, it's that, that middle segment. And I think why quiet quitting has become such this common topic, common theme is because you know, as always happens every couple of years, we have new generations entering that want different things than, than what a lot of times our cultures are delivering. So they're disengaged. They have no reason to believe that they have any reason and impact that is long lasting. So they get disengaged. So they do just the minimum so they don't get fired. And, you know, to me, that's, again, what are we, what are we going to look for in 2023 and beyond? It's how do you fix it? Talk to your people, get good leaders. Drive engagement, right? If they if they see, you know, the old, you know, start with why. If they understand why your organization exists and why what they do matters, they're much more likely to to get bought into it. Now, if what you do doesn't matter, that's different, right? But most organizations exist because they're creating value somewhere in the value chain. And so you need to communicate that and understand not only organizationally what value do you create, but what does that role what value does that create to the end product? It's a good point. Good point. I think that if you have a big enough workforce, there's always going to be a couple of outliers. And there's almost not anything you can do about it, unfortunately. Not everybody is going to be hardworking. Not everyone's going to put in their 40 or their 42. But you're always also going to have those outliers that do the exact opposite, that are your 40 to 45 hours a week people. And that's cool, too. I think that quiet quitting can be prevented for the most part. Um, and I think it goes back to culture, but there's an element within culture that's very important to me. I feel like it's very much relationship based. I think if you have a good relationship, a good rapport, you have communication with your team, that can be absolutely huge. So if they know they have a purpose, they know the team and the company has a purpose, they know we're all really trending toward the, the right direction, that's important. And I, I saw a video recently by uh, Bob Huggins, who for the longest time has been an NCAA basketball coach. A very interesting guy, big personality. And he was being interviewed and he was talking about a player of his who went on to play in the NBA. And he said one day, they're, they're in the football stadium and they're running up and down the stairs. And after about 
two times up and down. And th- keep in mind, they're like two minutes into a half hour workout or more. He said, coach, I'm not going to run. And he said, okay, well, then you can go home. You're dismissed from the team. He's like, well, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, you're off the team. Everyone else is doing it. And the guy started walking away. And he said, all right, okay, I I don't want you to be off the team. And he said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to run with you. And he says, he says, get this. I go up and down the stairs twice. And he is not an in-shape fit guy whatsoever. He's also a little on the older side. And he said, I was dying. I told the guy, literally, fuck off. I, I can't do this anymore. And he said, this was a turning point. After I got up and down the stairs twice, I was about to quit. And he said, coach, I got you. I'll run with you. And he said, all of a sudden, I did nothing, but I pulled the guy in and I said, I'm going to go. And he knew I wasn't capable of it. But as soon as he saw I cared about him, he wanted me to be able to get through the workout. And he's like, I went as far as I could before I passed out. Yeah. And that, that to me, what's interesting, I go back to coaching as we do all so often, is so often, I, I think as a leader, sometimes people don't care how much you know. They care how much you care. And when you can demonstrate how much you care in a, in a great culture and a great environment, I think that is when you can start to get the engagement and the relationship level through here. And that, to me, is, is a huge part of eliminating the quiet quitting. Absolutely right. Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that, that relationship level, it, it's a thing that it gets so easily overlooked. And the reason being is because everyone gets busy. I know even for myself, you know, you, you, you get your list of things. These are the things I need to tackle and, and you forget. Okay. But what really drives this thing? It's all about relationships. It's all about people. People are the thing doing the thing. And, and, you know, I think when you talk about that leadership development and why so many leaders don't have followers, <laughs> it's if you have no relationship, if you haven't communicated the why and, and, and they don't believe you're going to bleed with them, you know, the, the, the age old, I'm your manager doesn't work. No, nobody wants to work for a manager. So what pe- pe- people will still follow a leader, but people don't want to get managed. And that doesn't mean they don't want to be accountable. That doesn't mean any of that. There's a balance there, but you know, what, what's the leader you want to follow, right? And that, that's a fantastic story. I mean, that it speaks to, look, I'm willing to bleed with you. Well, it's a lot easier to follow a leader that, you know, the brave heart, right? Where I'm, I'm going to be right with you as opposed to the, you know what, why don't you go, you go do the tough stuff. I'm going to sit back here. So what do you see 2023 quiet quitting looking like? So I, I believe in this next year, I I think it really isn't going to change in my opinion. I, I I don't know that it really has changed. Uh, I I think there's a lot of talking heads and a lot of people that have talked about engagement and that this is this new thing. Again, I, I think this has been around for 20 plus years. Uh, I, I think when there's talk about it, I think maybe there brings a little bit more top of mind to people of, Oh, maybe I'm quiet quitting, right? Everyone else is not doing the work. Maybe I, I don't need to do it. Um, I, you know, I think from that perspective, I think that's gone. I think you know, with the economy being what it is, I think productivity is going to matter. I think everyone recognizes that. And, and so I, I, I don't think that part is going to exist, but I don't think it ever goes out of vogue to like what you talked about, to have good leaders building relationships that's driving engagement and buy-in to this is why we're trying to, to climb that, you know, climb that wall, take, take that hill. I think that's going to continue to be in vogue. And I think the thing you will see is I think if you're not paying attention to engagement, I think you'll continue to have it. I think if, if you are driving engagement, I think you're going to attract more of those people in this next year, because I think a lot of those people that are quiet quitting, they don't want to be that. No, they, they I don't just, think so. They're just disengaged, right? They, I don't think a, lot, a whole lot of people wake up in the morning and be like, oh, I hope I do nothing useful today. You know, most people want, want to go do something. They want to be part of something, and, but if they have no reason to believe it and no reason to buy in, who, whose fault is it? In my opinion, it's the leader's issue. I, I agree. I agree. So we got through, I think, three really awesome subjects. What, what is the fourth? 
uh, you know, the, the fourth to me is really getting the, getting back to the basics piece. Uh, so, you know, to me, that's everything we talked about all kind of comes back to the, the same element, which is, you know, what are you doing from a leadership perspective? Are you talking to your people? Are you driving engagement? You know, and are you, are you refocusing the organization for what this new world is going to look like? That's a good point. So I'm going to go back to sports again. And I, I love basketball. It's not my favorite sport, but it's, it's probably one of my favorites to watch and be engaged with. And I, I was fortunate to grow up with Michael Jordan. And while I'm, I'm not really a fan of LeBron or um, Steph Curry, I do respect their game. And I, I follow them because I think that nobody outworks the GOATs whether it be Tom Brady or anybody else. And when, when you listen to any interviews with Steph Curry or Kobe, who I think are their work ethic was absolutely unmatched in basketball. And you could argue that maybe Michael Jordan as well. Kobe would, would wake up. And if you watch the recent documentary, what's interesting to me is that he would talk about how he'd wake up at four in the morning or four 30 in the morning and he would hit the gym and he would shoot a thousand free throws or a thousand three pointers until he would make X number. And so to me, it, it really, it's fundamentals. And that, that's what I'm trying to distill this whole thing down to is they were so focused on the basics and they were so focused on getting the fundamentals right. That's true in football. Aaron Rodgers talks so much about footwork and fundamentals, balance, You'd think he'd be, oh, I want to throw about accuracy. I want to focus on distance. I want to focus on this. No, he is so focused on the basics because that is what allows you to do the big things. You get to be accurate as a byproduct of doing all the little things right. And, you know, why do you think Steph Curry can make all these three-pointers? Nobody shoots more three-pointers than Steph Curry because not only does he work hardest at it, but he focuses on dribbling. When you have kids like my own, and we know because we coach sports, especially basketball, they don't want to focus on dribbling. They want to play the game. And it it all has to go back to the basics, no, no matter what we're talking about. Golf, football, basketball, baseball, business, relationships. Absolutely. Everybody's looking for the shiny new toy. Everybody wants to learn the Euro step and what the next fancy uh, move is. But the, the bottom line is if you can't do the basics – or you're missing on the basics, it's going to rear its ugly head quickly. Well, yeah. How do you do a Euro step if you can't do the basics, like dribble between your legs consistently? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So getting back to the basics, what, what do you think are one, two, or three things that for those business owners, leaders that are watching, what are a couple things they can take away when they talk about getting back to the basics? So to me, I, you know, I, I go back in a lot of ways to a lot of things we've talked around with hustle. I, I think at the, at the very starting point, in order to get back to the basics, you, you have to realize what are the productive things that need to have, have to happen in your organization and really getting very crystal clear as to what those things are. Uh, in business, we can make the simplest task really, really complex. <laughs> And all of a sudden, the, the simplest thing that should take one step takes 20. And without looking at it, you, don't, you, you forget to realize what, how, how the hell did this get here? And so I think, you know, in a lot of ways, understanding what really is the thing that's driving your organization, having that clarity of what are the key behaviors, what are the key metrics that we need in order to uh, accomplish our goals? I think if you have clarity there, I think then this, the, the second basic is communicate, communicate, communicate. And I am amazed and no one ever gets it right because you, you can never communicate enough. That's the, the inherent problem. Because even if you're talking to somebody, you miscommunicate somehow. But to me, I think if, if you're really clear as to what that vision is, what are those behaviors, what are the expectations, and then communicate, 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 and not, not one way two-way communication so that you're, you're gathering feedback, you're having conversations, you're getting buy-in, you're, you're collaborating and figuring out how to get better. I think, I think if you do those two things really, really well, 
I think it's really hard to stop you from an organizational perspective. And I think that feeds into your culture. I agree. I agree. I think if you do those things and a lot of the stuff we talked about, productivity will be a byproduct. You, you, you won't have to keep talking about productivity. It will be a thing that happens because you've empowered your workforce. You've built great relationships. You've established great communication. And to one of your last points, I've always told my team and, and my colleagues, look, you can never over communicate. Almost never over communicate, you know, unless we're talking about sending me texts at 9, 9 p.m. or sending a client a text at 9 p.m. unless it's emergent. But I, I, that's important. That's important. Let's zoom out. Uh, let's let's put a bow on this conversation and th this episode. Let's finish with our 2023 pred uh, predictions. Perfect. Yeah, I, I believe that in, in 2023, I think. I think the new the new norm I think will officially start to take take hold. I think still in 2022 I think there was a lot of shifting. I think a lot of organizations were trying to decide who they are. To me 2023 yeah. is it's going to be about execution, it's going to be about consistency. I think you're going to you're going to see, you know, certainly a, a tough economy, it's going to you know create some challenges. But with that change, I think it's going to create tremendous opportunity for the right organizations and the right teams that are focused on culture, differentiation, doing things for the right reasons and hustling out to get it. Yeah, good, good point. I think a couple things is that companies will continue to be less geographic focused on their talent. And if you do that, hopefully, I think you'll start to, to win the war. You'll start to be more attractive uh, to more applicants. And ultimately, you have a wider net you can cast. So that, that's important to me. I think we'll continue to see more job jumping. Um, and that's okay. There, there's not much we can do other than continue to focus on what we can control and what we can do. And if you do that, I think you'll get people to stay longer. But the day and age of people staying at a role for 40 years, 30 years is mostly long gone. And that, that's okay. It doesn't mean we can't be successful. That that's, doesn't even mean that's a bad thing. Sometimes it's good to hit the refresh button, as my wife would say. Um, I think companies will get more creative, or at least that's my hope. They'll get creative with their job offers like we talked about. And I think that there's going to be a heightened level of expectations for executives, uh, especially as it relates to improving culture, improving and increasing uh, revenue and profitability. But I'll say this, like, if you focus on your culture and your people, and I feel like we're just hammering the subject, it costs a lot less to focus on what you have versus focus on attracting new talent. If you just take care of your current customer base or focus on your current talent, your, your, your team, the byproduct of that is they will take care of your customers. And if they take care of your customers, boy, I mean, that, that's a whole nother episode in and of itself. So the byproduct and the ROI of having good culture and taking care of your people so they take care of their people, so their, your clients, is absolutely endless. It is so much greater than anything else you could do. So for, for my takeaways, it would be go back and listen to this episode a second time because I, I think there are really some, some great nuggets in here. One or two takeaways could really be a difference um, in the culture that you're able to instill and grow in not only the rest of the year we have here, there's still time in the year to make an impact, even though as we record this, we're in mid-December. But I also think if you zoom out and you say, hey, th these are my goals for 2023, if you start that now, you can make a tremendous impact in your organization, not just in 2023, but in the first quarter of 2023. Absolutely agree. Any final thoughts, Dustin? Put a bow on 2022. Let's move on to 2023. Absolutely. Awesome. Great episode. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the future. For those of you listening and watching, we've got a lot in store for Hustle Nation, uh, especially as, a, as we zoom out and we look at 2023. Not only will we be ramping up more episodes, we're going to have some guests. We're going to dive into some what we feel like are, are really important subjects in the business world around leadership, coaching, productivity, et cetera, et cetera. So we hope you'll join us again. Thank you so much for listening. We'll talk to you next time.